United States Coast Guard is back at the important peacetime job of hunting icebergs in northern waters. Wintry storms in the North Atlantic Ocean provide perilous adventure along the busy shipping lane. Hunting icebergs charting their position and course and flashing warnings to ships at sea is everyday work for the Coast Guard. Grim memories of the liner Titanic and other vessels which have fallen victim to the treacherous icebergs are evoked by these huge pieces broken off from Greenland glaciers. Seven-eighths submerged. The great bergs endanger men and ships and must be constantly watched. The Coast Guard cutter Tampa is dwarfed by the menacing walls of ice. But much of the danger is removed when ships and planes of the Coast Guard maintain their constant vigil. Over ancient perils of the sea are spread the modern wings of the men of the iceberg patrol. Former President Herbert Hoover returns to Washington after a 35,000-mile presidential mission. Secretary of Agriculture Anderson welcomes him back to the American capital. At the request of President Truman, Mr. Hoover made a worldwide survey of the needs of famine-stricken countries and the ability of other countries to aid them. At the White House, Hoover reports to the President. The world's grain supplies are three and a half million tons short of the volume needed to prevent one of the worst famines in man's history. And in Poland, supplies from UNRWA arrive to ease the serious needs. Tons of foodstuff and clothing from America are distributed. Typical of thousands is this youngster, who hasn't had enough to wear for years. extra food above the meager ration brings a little happiness to a hungry child. Fed and in their new clothes, these members of the younger generation look to the future with new hope. York City on a foggy evening, an army plane seeking a nearby landing field crashed into the 58th floor of this Wall Street skyscraper. Parts of the plane, bricks and chunks of mortar fell to the street. Fortunately, New York's downtown financial and business district was deserted at the time. The terrific impact tore a 10-foot hole through the wall. The front of the plane was reduced to rubble on this office floor, 700 feet above the ground. Here, five bodies were found, the pilot and four others, including a women's Army Corps lieutenant. The fuselage and a wing of the splintered plane fell and caught on the 20th floor ledge, starting a fire. As the five bodies are taken away, this second terrible accident recalls last summer's similar tragedy when a plane crashed into the world's tallest building, the 102-story Empire State Building. Two such air collisions within 10 months in New York City spur engineers to find sure safety measures for aircraft flying over the crowded metropolitan area. United States Secretary of State Burns reports on the Paris Four Power Conference. We did not reach agreement upon the treaties, nor upon the question of calling a peace conference, or our proposal for a Four Power Treaty for 25 years to keep Germany disarmed. Our problems are serious, but I am not discouraged. Our offensive to secure peace has only begun. But we must not forget that if we fail to cooperate in a peace which is indivisible, we may again find that we will have to cooperate 
in a war which is worldwide. Whether we like it or not, we live in one world. The flag of China goes up over a former United States warship at San Diego, California, and the destroyer escort is taken over by its new captain, Commander Lin, shown with American Commander Heerbrandt, who will help convoy the ship across the Pacific Ocean. The Chinese crew has had special training in the United States to man the vessels turned over to China under lend-lease arrangements. Eight ships in all will comprise the first convoy. This looks like Chinese checkers, and the American sailors in return teach their Chinese comrades their favorite dice game. Sailors of both lands find a common ground of friendship as the convoy puts to sea. Out of London come new developments in Britain's plans for a changing empire. Under Prime Minister Attlee, the government of the United Kingdom shapes a new policy for freeing India and withdrawing from Egypt. The policies of Ernest Bevan and Attlee have been criticized by British conservatives. Here in Simla, India, the British continue their meetings with leaders of India's two major parties, Congress and Moslem, and hope to break the deadlock by the formation of a federated India. Demands by the Muslims for a separate state have been refused, and a tense situation grips all India. Kalem Azad, Congress party president, arrives by rickshaw. Pandit Nehru, famous Congress party leader, relies on his piebald pony for transportation. One of the few cars brings Muhammad Ali Jina, Muslim head, second from the left. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in Cairo, a closely related conference moves ahead. The British meet with Egyptian leaders headed by Sidki Pasha, Prime Minister. Lord Stansgate and the British delegation announce the end of a cycle of imperial history which has lasted 64 years as Britain prepares to leave Egypt. Back in India, the meetings continue. Behind Britain's decision to free India and get out of Egypt, Observers see implications of far-reaching significance. The new British government is revising old policies in the light of new developments and modern thinking. Past the Statue of Liberty and into New York Harbor, sails an army troop ship with over 860 refugees from Europe, victims of Nazi persecution. Many of them spent long, terrible months in concentration camps, but this is a happy day. In notorious Auschwitz camp, these girls' arms were indelibly tattooed with prison numbers. But in America, life will begin again. Also aboard are Polish Catholic priests, survivors of Dachau. A Jewish chaplain kept this Torah with him through all his travels. Of the children aboard, 75 are orphans. Many of them are without any records of their homes or even their nationalities. and friends are here to meet the newcomers, and they get a welcome they'll never forget. America opens her heart to those who long for life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness.